A very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Mills. I'm a senior associate at the Zien Group. And I would like to welcome you all to this long finance webinar on futures trading, a way to scale up the reuse of building materials and decarbonize the built environment. Now, I am joined by Tina Pei. Paye, the CEO and co-founder of CircoTrade, a trading platform which captures buildings unrealized value by listing, gauging and trading its components via an innovative futures contract. Tina has over 30 years of experience in international real estate, including developing and managing AUM, one of the world's largest real estate asset managers. Tina has also been leading green transformation in the sector by launching one of Europe's first green bonds and developing the decarbonisation strategies in line with net zero, owners, net zero Asset Owners Alliance commitments. Now, as always, the agenda for this webinar is very simple. Following my brief introduction, Tina is going to make her presentation and then we will move on to the Q&A discussion. Now, I'm afraid that you're all muted, but you are able to submit your questions, Tina, through the chat tool on the right-hand side of your screen. And you can do, do chip in at any point of the proceedings. I'm gonna be collating all your questions and I will put them to Tina at the end. Now, we're going to be recording this session and you will be able to access the presentation and discussion at a later date. Now, before we move on, I really must thank our sponsors from the FS Club. The FS Club is the premier global executive knowledge network for technology and finance, where members and their guests can meet over a glass of wine to debate key issues which impact on financial services, technology and society. It's very much like a 21st century version of the city's 17th century coffee houses. Now, Time is running on, and so, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Tina, please tell us how we can scale up the reuse of building materials and decarbonize the built environment. Well, thank you, Simon, for the very kind introduction, and it's really a pleasure to be here today in this virtual coffee room um, I think it's maybe a little bit early for a glass of wine for most of us, uh, but uh, definitely looking forward to presenting to all of you movers and shakers in the financial services industry out there today. And uh, looking forward to a lively debate and discussion once I finish with the presentation. Um, so I'm Tina Paye, co-founder of CircoTrade a futures trading contract and marketplace promoting the reuse of secondhand construction materials and products. Today, you will be learning why commodities futures trading is key to unlocking value in reused materials. Now, a lot of you probably in the financial industry have worked in commodities futures trading or are very familiar with it. So what I'm proposing today will be no surprise to you, but the real surprise is how can we use that financial construct of futures trading to boost the take up of reused materials and decarbonize the built environment? And how is CircoTrade driving that change forward in this area? So before we dive into the solution, I want to give you the economics around the embodied carbon and the waste conundrum operating in the built environment. And more specifically, right here in the city of London, a sort of circular state of the nation, if you will. The picture is both daunting and promising. You will hear about where the numbers sit, but also what solutions can bring about the reuse revolution we need to turn things around and around and around again? Um, if we could have the next slide, please. So calling out for all real estate investors, developers, manufacturers, or financiers of real estate and building materials. Combating climate change in the industry is crucial. 
Did you know that the construction industry emits 11% of our annual CO2 emissions just with the materials that are being produced? And that deploys over 50% of our dwindling primary resources along the way. Now, it probably hasn't gone unnoticed that because of those numbers, the circular economy, circularity, and reuse have now become the new buzzwords for the built environment. There are more and more conferences, webinars, white papers that are now focusing on the topic. But recycling, while still crucial to sustainability, is now seen as yesterday's landfill and for good cause. While it's known that our sector has a serious embodied carbon issue with virgin construction materials, recycling is also a very carbon intensive operation. Reuse avoids the carbon of remanufacturing and especially for products such as steel, aluminum, and glass. Could we have the next slide, please? So, this is why the Ellen MacArthur Foundation says that a circular economy could reduce global CO2 emissions from building materials by 38% in 2050 by reducing demand for steel, aluminum, cement, and plastic. Likewise, current efforts to tackle decarbonization are focused on energy related measures, and that would only address 55% of the emissions. A circular economy, according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is required to tackle the remaining 45%. Next slide. Yet globally, we continue to build a city the size of Paris every week. And building anything uses embodied carbon and the carbon clock is ticking. The City of London Corporation expects that by 2042, the city will need up to 20 million square feet of extra office space, up from around 50 million square feet today, as the square mile workforce is set to grow by 37,000 between 2021 and 2031. Tightening EPC regulations, that's Environmental Performance Certificate regulations, and or energy performance, I'm sorry, energy performance regulations and minimum energy efficiency standards will create pressure on the quantity, quality and efficiency of commercial premises. Many offices will see and will require serious fit outs to keep up. And where this is not possible, we will see demolitions and redevelopment. Next slide, please. This means that we will continue to have a waste problem if we keep building the way we currently do. The construction industry generates 62% of the UK's waste and 32% of all waste sent to landfill. Crucially, 13% of construction materials are diverted straight to waste without being used. And those are the numbers from DEFRA. For the decade to 2021, which is the latest stats that I could find, construction and demolition in the City of London generated 1.54 million tons of identifiable waste, or 2.7 tons for every person working in the city. That's a lot of waste and wasted opportunity because the opportunity for circularity is huge. It's estimated that 13.8 million tons of materials can be saved in the next 10 years through the circular economy alone, equating to a saving of at least 1.25 billion pounds. That's a big opportunity. And with that in mind, let's look at what circa 4,600 real estate construction, real estate and construction professionals from across more than 30 countries are saying in the latest sustainability report produced by the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Can I have the next slide, please? Just 
15%, first of all, maybe I don't know how many of you are aware of this RICS sustainability report, but the Rural Institution of Chartered Surveyors has been surveying the professional industry for about three years now and um, surveying them on their practices and their sentiment regarding sustainability issues. And what came out of their latest survey, which was just published at the end of last year, just in time for COP28, is that just 15% of contributors globally state that effective waste management and reducing embodied carbon in construction are essential features of a green building for market participants. That's very low. On a more positive note, roughly 50% say that demand for recyclable and reusable materials has risen over the past 12 months relative to other materials and components. However, well, around two fifths suggest that only demand has risen modestly. So only 7% note a significant pickup. Likewise, and this is an important number, around 43% of the respondents to the survey take no measurement of embodied carbon on their construction projects. So even those who are assessing their carbon, we find that there's very little evidence to show that it's having an impact on the choice of materials and components. Only around 16% suggest that they measure carbon across projects and use this to guide their selection of materials and components. This is the same pattern we saw in 2021 and in the 2022 surveys. Participants were also asked to categorize principles of sustainable construction from very well established to no progress has been made in their respective regions. On-site waste minimization, recycling, and reuse of materials after demolition appears to be at the forefront. Just over half of the contributors feel that these practices are well established or established across the sector. But my guess, given the statistic that's coming, is that most of this activity and this sentiment is centered around diverting from landfill rather than reuse practices. Could I have the next slide, please? So how does all of this sentiment translate in the real economy? The penny drops. Today, only 1% of building materials from a standard demolition process are actually reused, while the remainder is downcycled or sent to landfill, destroying value and creating over a third of the planet's waste. Construction materials and products deploy over half of our primary resources and, as I mentioned earlier, generate over 11% of CO2 emissions globally. In the UK, this is two-thirds of material waste production. Clearly, our take-make-waste approach is the problem. The solution lies in the reuse of those materials and products and buildings that we already have and which have already expended their CO2 emissions. We urgently need the industry to embrace the circular economy at scale. But if we could go to the next slide, this is not happening today. And financial risks are one of the main reasons. For a building owner, Preparing a building's materials for reuse by others is risky business. High upfront capital expenditure for an uncertain future demand. Let me give you a few examples. It's more expensive to deconstruct carefully a building rather than demolish it with a wrecking ball. It's more expensive to harvest building materials than to send them to landfill. It's more expensive to transport and store materials than to dispose of them. For development and construction teams, budgeting costs and availability of reused materials in advance of purchase is near to impossible. And specifying many reused materials and products without known technical specifications or guarantees can be uninsurable. For systemic change to happen, the current risks of the key industry players 
need to be mitigated and incentives identified. While there are many barriers standing in the way of the shift to material reuse, there is one that is a powerful, very powerful enabler to break down the others, and that's financial viability. So how can we overcome these barriers to increase adoption of material reuse? We'll find that out in the next slide, please. The solution is to adapt a financial construct going all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and Hammurabi's code, where the sale of goods and assets, at that time, agricultural commodities, could be delivered for an agreed price at a future date. This mechanism provided financial security and forward visibility in an otherwise uncertain world. Enter the very first active derivatives market, otherwise known as futures trading. Can we have the next slide, please? The solution that CircoTrade proposes is to bring the power of finance to the circular economy. In order to get the key sector players in this industry of real estate and construction and manufacturing of product on board, the CircoTrade solution needed to manage future risks, be financially beneficial for both the seller and the buyer, and follow a streamlined process where the actions and outcomes are known in advance. These are the very principles of futures trading. Can we have slide 11, please? Next slide, please. Ever before has this concept been used for secondary construction materials and products, whether that be for structural materials such as steel or timber, or for fit out materials such as partition walls, raised flooring, lighting fixtures, and the list goes on. To crack this, several pieces of the puzzle still needed to come into play in our sector. The impetus for changing the traditional take make waste modus operandi can be summed up in three main parts. The awareness of the climate crisis and its link to construction's embodied carbon. Check. That is now a known issue. Widespread industry decarbonization plans, either voluntary or compliance driven. Check as well. I'm sure a lot of you sitting on this call today and watching this webinar, your companies have carbon, zero carbon plans and targets that they need to meet. So this has now become widespread across all industries. And finally, Supply chain disruptions and price volatility of raw materials. Check. Raw materials and supply chains have been majorly disrupted over the past few years, starting with COVID disruptions, followed by geopolitical disruption in Eastern Europe, has meant that raw materials and volatility of, of uh materials as well as the feasibility and availability of materials within the supply chain have undergone very very heavy uh heavy um disruption over the past few years can we skip to the next slide so after i painted that picture you might be wondering so what is the circo trade solution to all this well, how are you taking, Tina, how are you taking all of this into account? The circuit trade solution is all about creating a new tradable asset class and at scale using three interlinking steps to capture a building's unrealized value by inventorying, gauging, and trading its components via an innovative futures contract and marketplace. The first of these three steps is CircoScan, the inventory. We consider that all existing buildings, no matter how new or old, are actually material banks waiting to be discovered. How many of you have assets, buildings in your portfolios, investment portfolios, or occupy a building which is owned by your company? 
and have no idea how much the materials that you have within that building are actually worth. This is what CircoScan is taking care of. We deploy market-leading technology and reuse inventory specialist teams in order to create a digital model listing your building's materials. Then we come to the second step, which is the Circo Pass. It's the gauging, a digital passport to quantify, value, and register your building's circular and CO2 footprint. It's all about gauging how much these materials would be worth on the open market as a future, and how much CO2 can be saved by, um, by, by reusing these materials rather than manufacturing new materials to replace them. And then finally, we get to CircoTrade, the trading part. And CircoTrade is a technologically enabled marketplace which facilitates the futures trading of a building's materials and embodied carbon via a matching service. So now buyers, sellers, designers, and developers can lock in quantities and prices and track and trade these new assets over time. The objective of a futures trading market for reused materials is nothing less than a full systems change in the way the real estate industry designs, procures, constructs, and deconstructs its buildings. In sum, we are creating a new industry and need to bring the main market players on board. We have identified three key beneficiaries that we are working with. If I could have the next slide, please. The first of the beneficiaries of the Circo Trade system are the building owners themselves, be they institutional investors and asset managers. With large commercial real estate portfolios in Europe and the UK, as they look to increase their ESG credentials, create value for their shareholders and investors, and get a head start in the race to zero carbon or to net zero. Can I have the next slide, please? Development teams, construction contractors, developers, and their design teams and consultants, as well as their financiers, will gain access to a database of future reused materials, which will allow for design and construction of low carbon buildings to specification and to scale with certainty. And this is a key part of the issue because today there are uh, a number of websites where you can, even concluding eBay, where you can buy reused materials. But those reused materials don't necessarily have the scale which is needed to tip this issue for a major residential or commercial project. So you won't be able to buy at scale these materials. It's fine if you just want to buy one or two sinks or a door for a home refit. But if you're looking to source 100 sinks or 500 doors and you want them to be to a technical specification which you can actually build into a future project, that's not happening today. This is what CircoTrade will be proposing. And then finally, the next slide. The manufacturers and salvage companies themselves, which today uh, need more than ever to hedge their construction material pricing volatility and to comply with voluntary and regulatory carbon, waste reduction, and circular economy targets can use CircoTrade to source large quantities of materials that they can use for producing low carbon and remanufacturing low carbon materials. So if we could move on to slide, the next slide, please. 
So where are we now? How, how is CircoTrade doing? And here in the city of London, I'm happy to say that we've carried out a pilot project on a 40,000 square meter office building. So that's about 400,000 square feet in the city of London, uh, just at the end of last year, which demonstrated a resale value of 7.35 million pounds or about a 1.5% increase in market value, as well as a 33 million ton savings of CO2 equivalent. If we could look at the next slide. The breakdown of this pilot project shows high value and high carbon savings for the reused steel, aluminum, and for a certain limited number of fit out products. We could go to the next slide, please. Today, the platform has gone live with a project in the city of London again. It's my stomping ground for a major REIT, 10,000 square meter office building, stripping out of all fit out materials and products. Over 200 types of materials and products have been inventoried with the Circo scan. We've also valued those materials for their embodied carbon and their resale pricing. And as I said, we've got a small cohort of traders um, that will be entering the platform in the days coming this week and next week. If we could have the next slide, please. So if you, in conclusion, if you are a real estate investor, a developer, a contractor, a manufacturer, or if you are a financier of those parties and you're interested in leveraging futures trading to create value while meeting your sustainability targets, do reach out to be part, part of this trading cohort that is just coming online. And also, if you're interested in learning more about how CircoTrade deploys futures trading for the built environment, please don't hesitate to access our white paper via the QR code on this slide. This white paper was developed with the support of the Circular Building Coalition as one of their blueprint projects. And I think that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to a healthy round of questions and answers. Fantastic. Thank you, Tina. That was absolutely fascinating. Now I can see we've got a lot of questions from our audience, but as the chairman, the privilege of asking the first one always falls uh, to me. So Tina, what's the low hanging fruit when you're dealing with construction waste? What, what materials are the easiest to reuse? Yeah, thanks Simon for that question. And first of all, I'd just like to say that I don't refer to this as waste, but I refer to this as secondary materials or resources because wording is important and so when we're talking about the low-hanging fruit as you said for the resources in our existing buildings which can be most readily reused today we see a couple of really really amazing uh, amounts of materials being reused in one of two areas the first one and i'll explain a little bit more why these are the areas that we're seeing the reuse, which gives me much hope that we will be able to extend this. The first one is in um, structural steel. Structural steel has been in such great demand that the few providers of reused structural steel actually cannot meet all of the demand that they are being asked for. And the reason why structural steel is in such high demand is firstly, it has a very high carbon value. A lot of carbon goes into producing steel. 
And even if that steel isn't virgin steel, but it's steel that has been made from recycled steel, it's still using immense amounts of carbon. And so if you really want a low carbon steel option for a building that you are developing of structural steel, you should be looking to reused steel sections. Steel sections are very long, they have a great longevity. The UK has actually produced a, um, a protocol, a standard for recertifying reused steel sections. And likewise, um, they are very valuable and very durable So for and, and standardized. So for all those reasons, structural steel is sort of hitting the sweet spot in the reuse market. The second reuse, um, I would say, category that's getting a lot of take up right now is raised access flooring. Um, for those of you who aren't technical, that's all that, all those panels that are hiding beneath the carpet tiles um, that are panels that uh, allow all of the cabling and other um, services to run underneath the floor. And these, again, are very uh, standardized, um, quite durable, and do have uh, recertification um, standards and uh, there are actors on the market who are regularly uh, recertifying and requalifying and reconditioning these um, particular materials for reuse. And they're also coming in high demand and are not enough are available. So the reason why those two are the low hanging fruit is because they already have requalification and recertification standards. and a supply chain of providers who are requalifying them. This is what needs to happen for the rest of the market, for those materials to go much wider list. And I think that Circo Trade will be providing the impetus to that because with the visibility of the materials coming to market, with the massification of those materials, um, other providers in this ecosystem can step up and start providing new standards and new business models around recovering and repurposing these materials. Fantastic. Now, due to regulation, the car industry is beginning to build cars which are designed for disassembly and, and component reuse. Should there be regulation imposed on the construction industry to do the same? Yeah, it's a great question, Simon. And I can say that there is a lot of push towards design for disassembly in the construction industry. And tools like BIM, uh, Building Information Management Modeling, are going to be very helpful for that. But also things that we are calling um, uh, material passports will be very helpful as well because what happens there is a new building is designed and the passport of each of those materials, its technical specification and its uh, ownership are registered in a passport, which can then go be passed down and used by the asset manager of the building, the property manager, can be passed on to a new buyer. And those are key initiatives that will really facilitate uh, design for disassembly. But I have to say one thing here. The reason why with Circo Trade we focused on existing buildings is that only 1% of our um, overall uh, real estate market is renewed each year. And over 80% uh, of the buildings that exist today will still exist in 2050. And the problem we have is that those buildings will start being renovated for energy efficiency, according to regulations. And those buildings need to be renovated in a way and with materials that do not blow our carbon budget day one. 
The problem with the building industry is as soon as you deploy it, even before the lights go on, even before the keys have been handed over to the end user, you've already expended enough carbon that no matter how efficient your building is, it probably will take 40 years or more to actually offset the carbon you used by building the building. So we need to keep our buildings, we need to renovate them, but above all, we need to be renovating and constructing with reused materials to avoid blowing our carbon budget too early. On the subject of, car of, 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 of carbon, is there any move to uh, create a carbon market for the construction industry? So you could actually gain credits for uh, disassembly and, and reuse that you could sell, you know, specifically for, for refurbishment. Yeah, so Simon, you've been reading in my mind. I had a few slides, given the time I cut them out on the work that I've been carrying out regarding carbon credits and actually a reused materials tax credit, uh, which I think could be extremely beneficial to roll out in the UK market. And I've started discussions with HMRC on the idea of a reused materials tax credit or tax relief, which I think could be really useful. Um, I know that uh, things like the EU ETS um, emissions trading system is being enlarged to cover uh, buildings, but that is mainly covering in the built environment sector, it's mainly covering the operational um, carbon, meaning the electricity. But the ETS uh, Fit for 50 covers things like concrete and cement uh, and steel and aluminum, mainly. And so those materials themselves will be coming across a um, carbon border tax the CBAM, I think it's called, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, when they are imported into Europe, which will allow those materials and those producers of materials in Europe to be that much more competitive with uh, exterior producers who may not be um, carrying out the same sort of uh, diligence and cost around decarbonizing those operations. So. I hope that's answered your question. I've got lots to talk about on that issue though. So more questions are welcome. So watch this space in other words. Now, how big is the Serco trade market at the moment and, and how big is it predicted to become? Oh, wow. There's the million dollar question. So today we are, as I said, we are uh, with our first live trade here in London. So it's early days and I wouldn't be able to give a sort of size of the market. What Circo Trade is targeting is uh, to have a significant percentage of the asset management market, meaning where we think asset managers, the major asset managers and real estate investor holdings have a huge conundrum in front of themselves, which is they need to bring their portfolio in line with carbon targets and they will be retrofitting. And those retrofit projects are what is targeted by CircoTrade as projects that we should be able to uh, add value to and to create value with by inventorying, gauging, and trading the materials that come out of one building and go into another during those refits. So it's a huge market potentially. Fantastic. Now we have got time for one more question. And I think this is literally the million dollar question. One of the issues you're facing um, is the innate conservatism of uh, the construction industry. It can take decades for uh, new construction um, techniques to be adopted. How can you overcome this conservatism? How can you get the message out there? And what role has government got to play uh, in, in pushing this forward? 
So, so there's two main prongs to that answer, and I'll get to the government one as the second prong. Um, the first one is really the whole uh, modus vivendi or the impetus behind circo trade was to create value. And when value is created, the owners of those buildings, who are what I'm calling very largely the client team in all projects, they have a vested interest in making sure that this value doesn't disappear into thin air when they have a building demolished. So once you have the client side on board and they see the value in the process, they will, and, and I was for a very long time, I think you might have mentioned it in the introduction, but for a very long time, I was a, a major real estate investor, developer, and asset manager. So I know how it works. And once you have a line item of value in your uh, balance sheet, you do not want to see that value destroyed. And I also know that when a client has their mind set on something, the rest of the design, construction, development team, including the insurers, the financiers, the whole ecosystem will fall into place if the client pushes hard enough for what they want. And so I'm counting on the uh, the client side to be pushing the envelope and making sure that this changes. And I have to say, I've had some really, really encouraging discussions with both investment side, but also the construction and the demolition side of companies that now, for the reasons that I've just said, their clients are asking for low carbon construction. They need to find ways to carry out the low carbon and reuse is a no brainer. So it's happening there. And I think the other prong is governmental regulation. And we've seen in countries such as France uh, and the Nordics where there is a whole life carbon um, whole life carbon assessment uh, requirement and a whole life carbon threshold that can not be overpassed by new construction or refurbishment projects, we all of a sudden see that with that sort of legislation, we are seeing a push towards more reuse because it's low carbon. So the carbon is almost a facilitator to pushing for reuse, which has umpteen other um, big positive uh, benefits too, you know, including local, uh, much more local job employment. Um, you know, it takes very little people to tear a building down with a few big wrecking balls. It takes a lot more qualified resources, human resource to deconstruct a building. And that's really valuable. And so we can see a shift of the money towards um, re, the shift of the money towards people rather than machines by going down the circular economy. Fantastic. Now, I'm afraid that time has caught up with us, ladies and gentlemen. I know that some of you have still got questions to ask. Please do contact Tina to continue this discussion, or you can email us and, and we'll pass your your questions on. It just remains for me to uh, thank Tina for her presentation and you, our audience, for your uh, contributions to today's discussions. I'd also urge you to keep an eye on the forthcoming events page for a truly eclectic mix of webinars, which include uh, the real high flyers migrating with birds and other animals and why this matters to the City of London, our supply chains and our future, which is taking place on the 1st of May. Generations, does when you're born shape who you are, which is on the 2nd of May. And global warming, energy costs and water poverty, the need for green plumbing in the UK and worldwide, which is on the 7th of May. You can catch up with all our previous webinars on our website, on our YouTube and our LinkedIn channels. We do hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.